Wow, what a wonderful room this is. We are so delighted to see so many of you all here. Um, this is a really special presentation from Dr. Neil Lamb, who I'm going to introduce in just a minute. And I want you to know for about the next approximately 90 minutes, you're going to hear some really amazing information about emerging trends and applications in genomics. But first, I want to say a special thank you to the sponsors for the entire 15th anniversary series, which is Avolution and the Keen Group at Morgan Stanley. I also want to thank the sponsors for tonight's event, Peg and Bud Heeshan and Paula Cushman. We are tremendously grateful to all these sponsors who made it possible for us to host these events free of charge for the public. So thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Lamb. As many of you know, Dr. Lamb is the president of the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. Before becoming our president, Neil was the vice president for educational outreach and established an education program that now reaches over a million students, teachers, and what we all are, lifelong learners. So I, I want to take a little poll here. Can you please raise your hand if you have attended a Biotech 101 or 201 program that Neil led? Neil, I don't know if you can see this, but just about every hand is up in the room. That is awesome. Thank you. So here's a little background on Neil. He graduated from Auburn University, War Eagle, with a degree in molecular biology and then got his PhD in genetics and molecular bi biology at Emory University. Before coming to Hudson Alpha, Neil was the director of education at Emory in the Department of Human Genetics and also taught students in their medical school. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone has told me over the last 15 years, if they had only had Neil Lamb for a science teacher, what a different career they might have chosen. Can we all relate to that? Yeah. Neil is a talented scientist and a gifted educator with a unique ability to help all of us who aren't scientists understand why this information is important to our lives, and I think that's why this room is full tonight. I believe he is a blessing to Hudson Alpha and to our community, and it's an honor for me to work for him. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Neil Lamb. Good evening, everyone. Elizabeth, thank you. That was lovely. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It is such a treat for me to be here tonight and to be with you. I have to resist the urge to say welcome to Biotech 101 or 201 because that's not what we are here for. Welcome to the anniversary series. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of genomics and biotech and where the field is taking us. But in order to do that, first, we need to take a look back. So I'm going to take us back to about 1950, 1955. So after World War II, Americans suddenly became infatuated with the field of, with, with technology and technological advances. And Americans believed that the world of technology was going to unlock a utopia of new opportunities. People would have to work less, we would have more leisure, we would suddenly get more things done, goods would be cheaper, and it was this entire vision of futurism, of, of what the next, what tomorrow would look like, that America was just infatuated with. You think about that, um, the Jetsons, uh, for those of you that might remember that Saturday morning cartoon of life in space. Or you think about Disneyland and the opening of Tomorrowland and that vision of the future and what that would potentially mean. So one of the people who was really at the forefront of a lot of this um, mid-century futurism, when we look back on it now, we actually call it retro-futurism, but of course at that point in time, it was retro, it was their world, was this gentleman right here, uh, perhaps. There we go. This is Arthur Radbog. 
And Arthur started his career as an illustrator. Um, he actually designed futuristic concept cars and did some really gorgeous work. But then about 1958, he started creating a series of cartoons that would show up in the Sunday paper. Now, maybe there is no one in this room that was alive in 1958, but <laughs> for the younger members of our audience, this is a newspaper. We used to get much of our information from it. And in the mid-1950s, while many Americans did now have a television, the television screen was about this big, black and white, with maybe three channels. So on Sunday morning, the comic section was major entertainment for adults and children alike. And Arthur created a series of cartoons in the Saturday, the Sunday morning comics called Closer Than We Think. And it was intentionally designed to showcase the potentials of this technological wonderland. And a, a second component of it was to excite the youth of the 1950s and early 60s into exploring careers in what today we would call STEM, so the fields of science and math and, and early technology. You have, on the front page of your handouts, you have one of eight different images that I've pulled from Arthur Radabaugh's Closer Than We Think. So hopefully you do not have the same image as the person next to you, but I want you to pull that out and I want you to take a look at it. Some of, it has, some of you have words to read, some of you don't have words, you just have images. And what I want you to look at is has any of what is on your page come true. So what is it that they're illustrating? Is that true or not? Has it missed the mark? And is there potentially something that you notice that maybe to our 2023 eyes, we see differently than in 1958? So I'm going to actually ask you now, having looked at that, I'm going to give you about a minute and a half and this is challenging in a room full of people, but I'm going to ask you to turn to a neighbor and share your image. And if it hits, if it, if it was on target or if it missed the mark, and then I'll pull us back together. So go ahead, share with somebody around you. Okay, I'm going to pull us back together. Arthur, Arthur uh, his health began to decline, and in the, in the mid-1960s, the early 1960s, he stopped doing the comic. At its peak, it was reaching 19 million homes across the country, and much of his work was forgotten for decades until it was discovered by people who then were looking back and actually called it retro-futurism. But here are a handful of some of the images. Let me just give you a couple of them. So this one is the Visaphone. Uh, you can actually see someone that you're talking to on a screen about the size of a silver dollar. And, you know, it looks a lot like a rotary phone. By the way, this is a rotary phone. <laughs> you actually had to dial the numbers. But when you think about today's technology, but, you know, th there are some pieces that really, that Arthur came pretty close to on that. So here's another one. What do you see, on, what do you see here? The plug-in car, an electric car, plugged, plugged in. Now, it also looks very 1950s, doesn't it? You know, the, 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 the fins and the chrome and, and the clothing is very 1950s. So clearly, while our vision of the future, some things changed a bunch of stuff. We're still stuck in 1950s clothes. But now here's one that doesn't age so well or didn't hold up. So this is your house under plexiglass. The idea being that in the summer, it's air-conditioned outside, and in the winter, it is a balmy 78 degrees. Um, I cannot imagine putting my house under glass in Alabama. I mean, <laughs> it would incinerate in a second. Plus, it'd be so humid that all this condensation would be on the outside, and I'd be like, could someone please go out and wipe down the outside? But so that's one that doesn't age so well. And in fact, there are a number of things that we might look back in 2023 and we would say, all right, there were some clear 
maybe some unconscious biases or some blinders that society put on. This is very America-centric. This was, this was all about America's technological um, success. This also had very little diversity. If you look through all of his work, it, there, it focuses almost exclusively on Caucasian individuals, and women are in traditional gender roles. They're involved in cooking, or they're standing behind the man who is the one actually doing the work. So there are some things that we look at today through a different lens, but still the concept of this vision of the future and the excitement of the future and where technology could take us seemed like a really fitting place for us to start before we now talk about what is the future of the field of biotechnology. So I want to gently step into this, acknowledging that I'm going to tell you about some trends, some things that are happening, and some potential projections, but very likely some of the things would be wrong. So if we were to come back 70, 80 years later, and somebody were to look at this, some of these things might have held up, and a lot of them might not. Now, if you do an, a Google search on future of biotechnology and you restrict yourself to the images, you get a lot of this, this very high-tech, lots of DNA images and people working in what looks like very sterile rooms, moving colorless liquids around. There's some healthcare imagery up here. There's some agricultural imagery. You also get a set of images that are maybe a little more cautionary in nature or a little more out there. Things about secrecy and privacy around genetics. This concept in the bottom left-hand corner that we'll all be like cyborg, half-human with all these wearables. I mean, it really looks like he just like plugs a USB drive into his neck. <laughs> I... And I never get the USB drive in the right orientation the first time, so I'd be like, you know, continually stabbing myself. And then there are pictures like the one on the right-hand side that talk about, you know, the future of, of um, artificial intelligence and what happens if everyone becomes, is suddenly a robot and machines rule the world. And is that a great thing because it gives us all lots of leisure time or are they going to all um, force us into, into labor mining cadmium from the deepest pits of the center of the earth? I mean, so all those components. The other thing that I was honestly not prepared for when I did this search, I thought I would find all those things, was this image. I had no clue how much the future of biotech would bring up images of beauty products. So these are all different beauty products, and apparently biotech is big news in beauty. And at first I thought, okay, this is really strange, this is bizarre, and then I started reading it, and you think about just start like this is clearly about hair because all these people have the most phenomenal hair. I will never have hair that looks like that. I never had hair that looked like that. But you think about the way we take care of our hair or the way we chemically treat our hair to color it or to straighten it or to curl it. And all those things are really damaging. But biotech opens the door to produce those same biosimilar molecules to change the shape, the, the texture of our hair, to change the color without some of the chemical processes. And you can begin to think about, I can actually genetically engineer, one of the tools we'll talk about, genetically engineer these products in a set of bacteria rather than trying to extract them from a field of lilies grown in the middle of Ethiopia, taking up enormous amounts of resources. So you begin to think about, all right, biotech also will be shaping the field of, of beauty and cosmetics as well. So with that background, here are the seven uh, emerging trends that we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to go through each one of these, a little bit of detail, some background, an example of how it's being used in the, in the world of science. And then I'm going to close each one with, and how is it actually being used here on Hudson Alpha's campus? Now, you might remember Hudson Alpha, as a nonprofit, has a number of research labs, independent um, Research labs are research faculty that are studying the role of genomics, some in human health and some in agriculture. So I'll talk about the work that's taking place in those different labs. And every single one of our labs hits at least one of these emerging trends. And then I'll also tell you about some of the companies. There are 50 biotech companies on the Hudson Alpha campus. I'm going to give you just a highlight of a few of them that are also using these emerging trends. Now, it's also really important for me to explain what I mean by the word emerging, 
because many of these trends actually were first developed maybe even 10 years ago and have now reached a tipping point where they're used much more frequently. There are many more groups that are using this and it's becoming, I wouldn't say it's mainstream, but we are now past a point where it's in pilot stage. So even though I'm talking about emerging, I think it's interesting to think about how long it takes the science to go from the first discovery until it has broader application. So let's start, number one, with pangenomes. So you hear me talk a lot about genomes. First of all, can I just say how much fun it is to be up here in front of all of y'all? I really love being here. This just, thank you. Uh, this is like my happy place. Maybe Disney World is a first and this would be my second happy place. But pangenomes, we've talked a lot about genomes before. The, a genome is the recipe, the collection of DNA that's present in a living organism. You and I have a human genome. There's a frog genome, a corn genome, a peanut genome. Pangenomes is not the set of genes that are involved in like your cooking, your kitchen cooking ware. But it is the entire set of genes within a species. So for example, if we were to talk about the tomato pan genome, we would gather every kind of variety of tomato we could find, including the wild tomato, and we would sequence through those and we would say, what are all of the genetic variation that you find across the entire species? Now we could not even have fathomed this. Even 10 years ago, we talked about the idea but the cost of sequencing was still incredibly expensive and the amount of work it took but today, sequencing is a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, depending on the tools and techniques you use. And now it really is possible to gather up huge numbers of varieties of a certain organism and sequence through them and look for their variation. And what you will find is you can divide the pan genome into two pieces. The core genome, which is the genome that's shared across all of, this, all of the varieties of that species. And then what's really poorly called the dispensable genome. Those are the parts that are not commonly shared. Now, what this, is, this is important because historically, historically, over the last 20 years, um, when we talked about genomes, we had a single reference. There was a human genome. There was a soybean genome. And we missed out on all the incredible variety that you had across the species. So it's kind of like this analogy. So here's a whole set of Southern cookbooks. Also, Google Images is a great place, a, you know, Google search. So you may have some of these. I know at least two of these. I think at least two of these are on our shelves at home. Um, and each of these has some set of recipes that are common. So for example, these are all cookbooks about the South, so I would bet that all of them probably have fried green tomatoes in them. They probably all have peach cobbler in them, and they probably all, except for the vegetarian one, have fried chicken in them. But think about if we just picked one of those recipe books and said this is the full spectrum of Southern cooking. You would have, well, what about my favorite recipe? What about mine? What about mine? That banana pudding is put in the oven. That is not my banana pudding. Or that banana pudding has whipped cream and not meringue. That is not my banana pudding. So when we talk about the pan genome, we're doing the exact same thing. We are capturing all of the variation, all the variety that is present. And that's important both for plants and for people. But let's start with plants. So many of the traits that we consider agronomically important, like our ability to grow under drought conditions or high heat or resistance to disease, so many of those, the genes and the variation in those genes that give us those important traits are in the disposable genome. So we don't pick up all that important variation if we only look at one reference. And that's all been bred out, all of those other traits. We bred them out when we domesticated plants because we specifically wanted all of the plants to look the same, to grow to the same height, to mature at the same time. And so diversity is a bad thing when you're trying to commercially grow plants. But the problem is we lose all that beautiful variation. 
So this gives you just a sense of, we first started talking about the concept of the pan genome in 2005. That's up at the very top left-hand corner. But then you can see it wasn't until 2014 that we had the first set of soybean pan genomes, which was done in collaboration with Hudson Alpha. And then really it's 2020 where this really begins to take off. And you now see all these different plant pan genomes. And the different colors correspond to the different types of sequencing technology. So the dark green is the historic kind of sequencing. It's called short read sequencing. The light Light blue is a, more, um, is a newer version, it's called long read. Plants really are complicated with their genomes and long read sequencing is easy. We can get more with long read that we can with, than we can with short read. But again, we're not going to dig into any one of these, but it just shows you more and more we are uncovering genetic variation that is critical for how we think about growing more food under changing climates. Now the same is true for humans. We've had a human reference genome. And only this year did we actually begin to build that out to the pan genome. So this is a publication in the journal Nature, one of the preeminent science journals. And it's the human pan genome, 47 individuals sequenced one end of the, of the genome to the other, the most complete that we've got. And we are identifying as much as 10 to 15% of genetic variation in the pan genome of humans that we did not have because it was not in the reference. So why do you care about that? Well, let's say that I have a specific set of, of symptoms and I go to a clinic, maybe the Smith Family Clinic here, here on campus, and my genome gets sequenced. There'll be about four million variants, four million changes in my DNA compared to the reference. But if I have a specific variation or a specific region that isn't present in the reference, it gets screened out and not even looked at in some cases. The pan genome gives us that broader depth to be able to say, oh yeah, I see that in other individuals, or no, I've never seen that before. I think that's something we need to investigate. Maybe that's a disease-causing mutation. So the image, that this is beautiful. I love the way that people think about how to visualize science rather than just tables and tables of data. Each one of these rows is a different individual, and they're colored differently. And then the, the, you're looking at a very small section where you can see how some of these rows like loop out or they flip around or they connect in or they're in buckets, like maybe one has an A around it and one has a T. That's a way to visualize the kind of variation that you see in the population. At a glance, you can get a sense of, let's see if I can do this in both places. So here, at this specific spot, the orange has the letter G at this specific spot. But these other sections below it, at that same spot, have a C. And then this piece at the very bottom in green is completely missing it. So it's not there at all. So the pan genome is a way for us to begin to gather that information. And at Hudson Alpha, which I think is my next slide, yes. At Hudson Alpha, we look at the pan genomes of both humans and of lots of different plants. So Dr. Greg Cooper has a study where he works with children and adults with um, undiagnosed developmental and neuro uh, um, uh, intellectual delay, and he sequences through their genome. And in a number of those cases, he actually finds changes that are associated with, uh, with those symptoms. But he is now moving to that long read sequencing technology and building out the human pan genome with the people that are part of our research study or patients that come to the Smith Family Clinic. Dr. Kangshita Swaminathan is actually studying the pan genome of Miscanthus. It's a wild biograss. Dr. Josh Clevenger is building out the pan genome of peanuts. Josh is probably one of the world's leaders on peanut genetics. He is at the heart of the research component and part of the education component of Hudson Alpha Wiregrass, the work that we're doing in Dothan. And we've got some Hudson Alpha Wiregrass folks over there. So uh, welcome. It's great to have you all. Thank you for, for making the drive. And then... Jeremy Schmutz and Jane Grimwood had the Genome Sequencing Center, which was part of the Human Genome Project back in the day, and then transitioned to working on the genomes of plants. And you can see all the different plants that they have been involved in building the pan genome of. We are really a huge center of pan genomics as it relates to plant work. All right. I'm not going to take that much time on every single one of these in case you're looking at your watch and going, we're going to be here till 10 o'clock tonight. I promise Elizabeth will drag me off the stage. It will, be, it will be fine. But number two, artificial intelligence. So 
let's do a little bit of definition. Because artificial intelligence is in the news a lot, sometimes in really cool ways and sometimes in kind of not so cool ways. So with artificial intelligence, computers are taking on the tasks that humans traditionally, has traditionally required some level of human thought, some kind of, of human processing. And now computers are doing that. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's start with Hey Siri or Hey Alexa. It used to be that you would say, Hey, son, would you please turn down the radio, or would you please turn the television on? Nowadays, Siri or Alexa does that for you. Self-driving cars, facial recognition, if you hold your phone up and it recognizes your face and unlocks for you, that's an example of artificial intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's a specific set of algorithms and computational tools that let the software identify patterns in data. And not only identify patterns in data, but also make decisions based on that data. And this is the part that's really cool why it's called learning, because the machine, the, the algorithms are tested on one set of data to figure out, okay, what are the general rules? What are the things I'm looking for? And they learn how to make those decisions and recognize those patterns, and then you give them completely new data they've not seen before, and off they go and they're able to do something with it most of the time. So that's the concept of machine learning. You train it on a set of data, and then you turn it loose on another set of data. So why is AI important for the field of biotechnology? I mean, I can get it if we're talking about marketing or if we're talking about social media or maybe defense, but why biotech? Well, the field of biology is set to use more data, to generate more data than any other field in the world. More than Facebook and Instagram, uh, more than X, Twitter, X. This is a graph from the European Bioinformatics Institute. And EBI is one of the world's uh, places where they store life science data and make it freely accessible. It's an incredible tool for any life science researcher around the world who wants to have access to genomic information or uh, patient um, uh, de-identified patient data or imaging data. Every single one of these lines represents a different type of data. And you can see on the far left, 2008, to about 2021 when this graph ended, every single one of these goes up. And let me also point out that this is a logarithmic scale. So this is exponential growth. So going from one point to the next is an increase of, of uh, 10,000, a 10,000 fold increase. And just as another really interesting point, in 2008, uh, we, were getting some, we were storing data where the total amount of data we were storing was about a terabyte. Today, in 2023, you can buy an iPhone with a terabyte of storage. So just how incredibly rapidly the field changes. But big data is a huge part of the field of biotechnology, especially um, genetic data. And so how we analyze and mine and sort that all the people in Huntsville together working to sort through data on a specific project would not be able to make as much progress as AI and machine learning algorithms. So it is truly the way that we advance our study of all this information. So here's an example, ChatGPT. Anybody use ChatGPT before? Yep. So I went to ChatGPT. And I, uh, you can set up an account. It's free if you use the uh, slightly earlier version of ChatGPT. And you can see on the right-hand side, I said, explain how artificial intelligence and machine learning are used in biotechnology. And then it started giving me information. Now, this is not a Google search that says, go to this page where somebody else has written this. ChatGPT is looking at all the information that it has in its databases. It's pulling it out. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's synthesizing information and then it is giving it back to me in a way that I can understand. It was incredible to watch. And so at the end, it gave me 14 different places where biotechnology uses AI and machine learning. But it was pages and pages and pages of stuff. So then I said to it, make this shorter. <laughs> and it did. 
And that's what it gave me. And I'm not going to read it to you. You've got it in your handout. But then I said, write this so my grandmother would understand it. And it made it even more simplified. And it talked about scientists trying to put together big puzzles of data. And then you can go back and say, I want you to focus in on X, Y, or Z. And it will expand that out. Now, I know a lot of people have concerns around chat GPT. And I get that because it is, you know, if it can do all this work for us, then why am I in my English literature class? Or why are journalists writing content? And I want to be really clear. I'm not trying to minimize some of the things we have to be, some of these questions that we have to ask around AI and big data. But the world of data, you and I, Google is great. Bing, whatever your favorite search engine is great. But how do you synthesize information? You have to read all of those pages and then figure out how you make sense of that. And this is still wrong. I, I chat GPT'd and said, write the biography of Neil E. Lamb. And I did it 10 times, and four of them were totally wrong. Four of them were like made up stuff like, wow, I wish that was my life. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> but these tools are in their infancy, and they will get better and they will help us analyze and sort through data. And here's a beautiful example. We've talked about DNA as the recipe code, and the product of those genetic recipes of our genes are often proteins. And proteins fold in a very specific way in order to have their function. So you think about, for example, insulin. If insulin doesn't fold in just the right way, it will not be able to do its job. People that have cystic fibrosis, the specific protein, in many cases, people with cystic fibrosis, they make the protein, but it folds improperly so it can't do its job. So one of the key questions in science is how do we predict, if I know a piece of DNA, how do I predict the proper shape of the protein? People spend years trying to determine one protein structure. Google has a, program, has a group that they own called, well, I should say Alphabet, the parent company of Google, owns DeepMind. And DeepMind trained their algorithm on something like 150,000 protein structures and amino acid interactions. And then, in a matter of months, predicted all of the shape of all the proteins in the human genome. That's like a billion, with a B, years of researcher work. And is it perfect? No, it's not. But it gives a scientist an enormous leg up and a place to start. So AlphaFold was like in all the news at the end of last year. And then, of course, we then had Meta, which is owned by Facebook and Instagram. They produced their... Uh, protein fold, and it predicted all of the shapes of the proteins in all the worlds of viruses and bacteria in two weeks. So again, this is, this is what AI can begin to give us in the field, to begin to, to do that kind of work. Now, somebody still has to think through. Somebody still has to ask the questions. This does not take the place of the creative mind. This does not take the place of the questioning but with all the data in the world at our fingertips, how do we sort through it and separate the wheat from the chaff? And AI opens those doors for us. So at Hudson Alpha, we use AI. Um, two of our research labs, Sarah Cooper, uses AI to predict specific mutations that impact patient response to treatment or outcomes to cancer. So that, kind of, that predictive tool becomes really important. Dr. Rick Myers looks for meaningful patterns in data comparing normal and abnormal brain function. Again, massive, massive amounts of data, and AI is actually able to help him sort that out. And then there are three biotech associate companies on our campus that are using AI either in their software to help decision making or to help think about how you actually uh, sterilize and prepare medical instruments, or um, in the case of Acclinate, how you can identify individuals that would be potential candidates to participate in clinical trials based on other information. So we will see more and more of this. And yes, there are questions that we need to ask. I don't want to downplay that. But I can't stress enough what a game changer it is to have these tools that let us sort through data. All right, option number three, single cell technology and spatial biology. This feels like science fiction to me in so many 
ways. And there's a lot of words here, so let's break that out. Let's first start with single cell technology. So single cell technologies reveal what's going on at the level of an individual cell. People in the front row are starting to get nervous because I'm now walking towards them. (laughs) So think about traditionally, if I want to study muscle, I may take a muscle biopsy from someone, and then I'm going to grind it up to separate and break open all the cells, and I'm going to study the genetics or maybe the proteins that are present in that biopsy. But that muscle biopsy doesn't contain just one type of cell. It contains dozens of different types of cells, each with a little bit different pattern. But by just looking at one biopsy and blending it all together, I lose all that distinction. The power of single cell technology is being able to look at each individual cell and say, what's happening in this cell and this cell and this cell? So it provides incredibly higher level of detail, but it means you have to separate out the cells. I'm not gonna walk us through this slide because there's a lot on here, but the tools now let you gently break apart. So for example, muscle tissue, all those cells are held together by collagen, collagen networks, and you can gently digest the collagen and now you end up with all the individual cells. There are tools and techniques to separate those. And then there is this really amazing set of technologies that let you individually tag each single cell. So I don't know if any of you have like the Apple tags. I promise you, this is not an Apple commercial. It just sounds like it. But you know, the Apple tag that you can like put in your luggage and then you can track where your luggage is. So that kind of technology miniaturized, linked to a single cell. So I can say, Here is the tag that all of this cellular information connects back to. And it's a separate tag from this cell and all of its information. So I can separate the cells, I tag them, and then I can look at the DNA, or I can look at the level of proteins, or I can look at the level of RNA, which tells me if genes are turned on and off. That gives me massive amounts of data. And then we use machine learning and AI to go through and build a profile every individual cell. All right, in this cell, which genes are turned on? How active are they? Which genes are turned off? Which proteins are being produced? And then you graph that. Now, many of you have graphed things on like an X and Y axis, and sometimes you've even graphed them on a Z axis to put things in three dimension. I want you to imagine graphing them on a graph that has 20,000 axes. Because each different axis is a different gene in the cell measuring its activity. So I can't even get my head around what 20,000 axes look like, but a computer can with no problem. And so a computer can take every single one of those cells and say in this cell, what's the activity of gene one, gene two, gene three, gene 100, gene 20,000, and bloop, here's where it goes on the graph. And it does the same for all of the rest of them. And then because you and I can't comprehend 20,000 axes, it very nicely flattens it down into two or three dimensions for us that our brains can begin to comprehend. But you get something that looks like this on the left-hand side of the screen where every different color, every dot is an individual cell plotted on that axis based on its activity of all of its genes. And you can begin to see cells that cluster together because they have similar gene activity. Similar things are taking place in those cells compared to cells that are clustered in a different color that have been colored by the computer or in a different space. So you could now say, all right, well, in this tissue, there are six different clusters, seven if you count cluster zero, and then these hemopoietic cells over off on the right-hand side. So you can begin to tell how many different types of cells are in the tissue and how they're similar and how they're different. And then you build a dot plot, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, where you can say, for these different types of cells, what's the specific defining feature? And it's a little tricky to tell, but on the far right, it says lymphoma. So for these cancer cells, what is the specific feature that that tells me this is unique, this is different? So it lets you begin to think about detection and biomarkers, which we'll jump to in just a second. But that's the power of single cell technology. I am looking at what is happening in each individual cell. Now, the problem with that is I broke all those apart, so I can't say that this cell and this cell are right next to each other in the tissue. They might be at total opposite ends of the tissue, 
That's where spatial biology comes in. Spatial biology lets you take a cross-section of tissue, so you might freeze it or you might put the block in paraffin. This is actually a breast cancer um, set of cells. You take really thin slices, you image it, and then you actually do a little bit of what I just described. You do um, a number of maybe 100 or maybe 200 genes where you're measuring the activity. But now, because it's all together, you actually can see these cells next to each other. But the cell on the other side of it is a completely different cell type. So you get that three-dimensional component, which is what you see on the right-hand side. Each different color is a cell with a different type of activity or a different pattern of expression. So ideally, you want to put these two together. So I know everything that's going on in the cell, and I know its three-dimensional orientation and origin. And that leads me to this really amazing example of the human cell atlas. This is the equivalent of understanding cell activity to what the Human Genome Project was. This is an incredibly audacious goal. I think there are 2,700 scientists around the world working on this. The goal being to take all 37 trillion, with a T, cells in your body and do this single cell analysis and be able to tell the activity across the different types of cells. This is going to be enormously valuable when we put in the goal is to have this done by 2025. Yeah, yeah, 2025. Some of you are still stuck on 20,000 axes. <laughs> I, I am. Um, so how do we use single cell biology and spatial, single cell technology and spatial biology at Hudson Alpha? So Nick Cochran, Sarah Cooper, um, Rick Myers, and Kenkshita Swaminathan all use single cell biology in their research to be able to understand what is happening in whatever cell sample they're working with. For Sarah, it's ovarian cancer cells. For Nick and for Rick, it's brain samples for individuals with neurological disease and neurodegenerative disorders. Kangshita is actually developing this in plants. Plants are kind of like the next frontier in single cell analysis. It's been a little bit trickier to work with. But again, the goal being able to say not just what's happening in this ground up set of tissue, but what is happening in the individual cells and how can I distinguish and differentiate what's taking place there. And then Discovery Life Science, one of the associate companies, actually offers a service working with people that are interested in doing single cell analysis of sample X, Y, or Z. All right, We're at, we are at the midpoint. All right, we're good. We're at the midpoint. So let's talk about induced pluripotent stem cells, IPSCs. I am flooding you with information. I recognize that. Some of you are like, where is that, where is that intermission? I need another cookie. <laughs> so induced pluripotent stem cells, IPSCs. These are cells that are taken from the body, skin cells, blood cells, and they're reprogrammed, so they're induced to behave as if they are embryonic cells. So there's, amazingly, a pretty simple set of genes that you can activate that reprogram a cell to now forget that it is an adult skin cell and it now behaves as if it has the, an, it is an embryonic cell and has the potential to form all types of other cells. So that's the pluripotent part of induced pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotent means it has the ability to, take, to form multiple, multiple types of other cells. And you can gently nudge it with some chemicals and some nutrients in a dish to begin to form a neuron or to begin to form a heart cell or to begin to form a muscle cell that's a skeletal muscle cell. So you can take a person's skin cells induce them back to an earlier state, and then differentiate them into all these other forms. And when the technology was first developed, it was thought that it would change the face of regenerative medicine. I mean, think about it. I can take my own cells and I can re, you know, I can induce them and I can de-differentiate them, and now I'm going to inject myself with cells that are my own, but now suddenly my failing heart is going to work perfectly, or my failing kidneys. It's taken a lot more work in regenerative medicine than people initially thought. There's always that moment of incredible exuberance, and it's always much more complicated than that. 
But I will tell you about a really cool regenerative medicine story in just a second. But where iPSCs have become incredibly powerful is in a research setting, because it's difficult to get people to be willing to give up parts of themselves for research studies. It's not very easy to say, hey, would you mind if I took a tiny piece of your brain? You won't miss it, I promise. And oh, by the way, while I'm there, can I have one of your kidneys? But you now can take skin cells either from a patient or actually there are some cell lines that were started from, pa from skin cells that now grow really, really well and you can differentiate them that you can actually buy. Um, I was about to say buy online and that sounds like selling your body parts online. So <laughs> you can buy from reputable sources. Let's go with, with that. But you now can say, all right, I wanna understand how this genetic mutation impacts kidney cells or lung cells, or liver cells, and not just lung cells, but all the specific kinds of cells. Because as I told you, we can now do single cell technology in 3D spatial biology, so we can separate those out. So iPSC cells now open the door to understanding the functional impact. They open the hood on what's taking place in cells in ways that we never could do before. It's incredibly powerful. Uh, that's the visual graphic of what I just described. Uh, and so let me tell you this. Whoops, let's back up. Let me tell you this story. This is early, early study. This, this paper was published July 25th. So these researchers um, are looking at the idea of iPSCs to regenerate the neurons in the brain that produce dopamine that are lost in people that have Parkinson's. Now, people with Parkinson's lose these. It's a degenerative disease. They lose these, these neurons over time. It affects their ability, their motor function. So the question was, could you take skin cells, blood cells, skin cells or blood cells, and could you create iPSCs and then nudge them to form neurons? And then could you implant them in brains and see if they fully grow into functioning neurons producing dopamine that help reduce the loss of motor function. Now, you cannot just jump from that idea to patients. You can't just go recruit people off the street and say, hey, let's try this thing. So what these researchers have done is they've taken patient skin cells, they've created iPSC cells, and then they've created neurons, and they've created neurons at different stages of development. So think of like baby neurons and then like teenage neurons and then like, you know, 19-year-old, you know, almost adult neurons. And they implanted them into the brains of mice that have a specific model that is not identical to but similar to Parkinson's. And the question is, first of all, do any of these actually take in the brain and begin to produce dopamine? And does that make a difference? And if any of them do, is it the early stage? Is it the middle stage? Is it the more adult stage that seems to make a difference? And what they found is that the earlier, the, the, the just barely developed neurons do a better job, they seem to be able to continue growing and making connections when they're implanted in, and they do produce dopamine, and they do reduce the motor neuron law, the motor function symptoms in these mouse models. Now there's a whole set of steps before we ever think about what this means for, for patients, but that is powerful. Now there's lots of cautionary tales about things that work great in mice in the brain that do not work at all in humans. So I wanna be very, very clear about that. But that shows you an example of iPSCs and where you can go with that. So at Hudson Alpha, Dr. Nick Cochran, and Dr. Greg Cooper and Dr. Rick Myers use iPSCs, iPS cells. Specifically, all of them are studying brain cells. They're looking at, uh, they take skin cells or blood cells and they um, induce them and then they differentiate them into neurons and they can actually study what's happening with single cell techniques. I hope you're beginning to see a theme here. These things don't stand alone, but you can build on them because then they use machine learning and AI to help interpret what all that information means. Okay, let's take a breath a second because I've covered a lot of information. 
I'm talking about advances in the field that are used not just in humans, not just in plants, not just in bacteria, but have broad application. There are a whole set of these kind of advances that still await discovery. It's one of the things that I love about this field. It's one of the things I love about Hudson Alpha. I have the incredible pleasure, the privilege, the honor to walk into the doors of a building where every day somewhere on this campus, someone is making a discovery that no one knew before. That's an incredible, incredible place to be. And there are even more discoveries out there. We think we solve something and then we discover, oh wait, there's like 15 more questions that that raises. How do I move forward from there? Which brings me to the concept of gene editing. Now, we've talked a lot about gene editing. I think gene editing has been in almost every one of the Biotech 101s for the last probably seven or eight years. We did an entire Biotech 201 on gene editing. You can go back and find those on the archives if you want. But it's the molecular equivalent of find and replace in your word processing software. So it is a set of proteins. It's like molecular scissors that look for a specific DNA sequence and edit it out they change it or they completely take it out. It's very precise, it's very targeted. CRISPR is the best known of these, but there are lots of other gene editing tools as well, each that kind of build on the other and have advantages and disadvantages. And it truly has transformed the field because now you can realistically think about what happens if I make an edit? What if I change something specific in the DNA? All right, so these are some pictures that I uh, pulled, some, some web things that I pulled from the last couple of weeks. This company plans to transplant gene-edited pig hearts into babies next year. Yeah, some of you are like, Arr. some of you are like, wow. So at any one time, there are probably 100,000 people in America that are on transplant lists. And from what I understand, especially for heart transplant lists, every day seven of those individuals die because they aren't able to get a heart. You might remember at the very end of 2021, beginning of 2022, uh, a gentleman had a pig heart implanted in him because he wasn't eligible for a transplant and his health was failing fast. And he lived for several weeks with that pig heart. Now, pig hearts are about the same size. They're very similar to human hearts. But... There are a set of viruses that have left their genetic signatures in the DNA of pigs that are potentially problematic to humans and can trigger immune issues. So at that time that this gentleman had that first pig heart implanted, they gene edited about seven or eight of these genes out. And he ultimately died, but not from anything from the, not because of anything with the, with the gene editing. Well, this company has identified about 70 different edits that will make pig hearts much, much more compatible with humans. And this will all be part of a research study. I mean, nobody is, again, gonna, you're not going to find this on Google search. Uh, but the idea is if we can make safe alternatives because we don't have enough resources, we don't have access to hearts for babies, is this something that either is a temporary window that carries them through, or is this a permanent potential treatment for that? I, I don't know. We'll have to see what the clinical trials look like. But that's an example of using gene editing in a way that probably none of us ever thought of before. This also has huge implications for agriculture. In fact, gene editing is leaps and bounds ahead in agriculture than it is in human health. There are dozens of plants that currently have had their genes edited to specifically produce some better trait, some more desired trait, to increase the nutrition. Now this is very different from GMOs, where we actually bring in a gene from another organism and we insert it into the DNA. This is the plant's own DNA that you have essentially done the equivalent of a random DNA change, a random mutation that happens, that happens naturally. You've just made that, that edit. The Farm Bill is a huge omnibus bill that covers a whole lot of America's ag. It gets renegotiated roughly every five years, kind of. Um, 
And there's a lot of biotech in the farm bill, including things around gene editing. There's a really nice article, and when I say really nice, I mean it's not written in tons of science ease from the United Nations um, Food and Agriculture Organization that I've, that I've got here, and the link is on the bottom of this next page, that talks about gene editing in agriculture. And here's a set of plants that they knew at the time when they put this together last year that were currently in the process of undergoing field trials around gene editing. And you can see some of them on the right-hand side are for improved food or field quality, feed quality. So it changes the, the concentration of the different fats or the proteins in it or lower gluten in wheat, for example. The middle column is specific properties about its growing. It makes it resistant to a virus or tolerant to a drought or tolerant to higher levels of salt in the soil, which is especially important if you grow near the coastlines where seawater sea creeps into the water table. And then on the right-hand side, down at the bottom, are applications in animal breeding, like hypoallergenic melt, milk, or um, high-yielding cashmere goats. Um, but anyway, so there's a lot of gene editing taking place, both in humans and in ag. And I want to give you one story that I find absolutely fascinating. So let's take a step, let's take a step back. Let's talk about paper plants. So when a paper plant is going to process and they're going to produce, <laughs> the only thing I can think of right now is that commercial about toilet paper and about how every time you use a roll of toilet paper, they plant a tree. Um, not the example I was going for, but that's what came to my head. But anyway, paper products are generally made from cellulose. Cellulose is a carbohydrate produced by plants. It literally grows on trees. <laughs> the challenge is that in order to get the cellulose out of the tree or out of the, the limbs, you have to separate it from the stiffer woody material, which is one of those components is lignin. Lignin is really difficult to separate out and it requires pretty harsh chemical processes. So you create a significant amount of chemical waste at a paper processing plant, at a paper mill, and also there's a whole lot of greenhouse gas that gets, that gets released in, the, in that process of production. So if you could figure out how to produce a tree that has less lignin and more cellulose, you potentially now have created more product with less waste and less environmental impact. So a group of scientists in North Carolina said, well, let's try that using gene editing. Let's see if we could make specific changes, lower the lignin and increase the carbohydrate to lignin ratio. And so they used machine learning and they looked at 70,000 different strategies across 21 different genes to say, well, what if we change these? What if we change these? What if we do this combination? 99.5% of all the combinations were problematic. Like, for example, if you don't have enough lignin, your tree droops over. That's kind of problematic. So how do you have enough lignin to give your tree structure, but not so much that it makes it more challenging to process the cellulose? So they identified the top set of tools, again, machine learning, generated those edits through CRISPR, 174 different trees, and they grew them in a greenhouse for six months. And then they looked at the lignin amount and the carbohydrate concentration to measure those out. In the most successful varieties, the lignin was down by 50% without an impact on the sturdiness of the tree. And the carbohydrate to lignin ratio was up 228%. Now, I want to give you what that means in real terms. Let me go to my notes on this. If these varieties prove successful in the wild, and let's be clear, growing in the greenhouse is not the same. Those of you that experience these straight line winds that have come through, that's not happening in a greenhouse. <laughs> so growing them in the field is very different. But if these things hold true, a typical paper mill, because they primarily use poplar trees as their pulp, a typical paper mill could increase paper output by 40%, cut greenhouse emissions by 20%, and boost its lifetime profits by a billion dollars per mill. Per mill, yeah. So that's that kind of, of potential application of this out in, in the real world. So there are a number of folks that use gene editing 
at Hudson Alpha. Uh, Sarah Cooper, looking specifically at which genes seem to control um, issues around chemotherapy resistance. Rick and Greg Cooper, again, studying these neurons from induced pluripotent stem cells. Jeremy and Jane, editing sorghum along with Kangshita Swaminathan to understand nitrogen use and fertilizer uptake. If you can increase nitrogen use from your root cells, you decrease the amount of fertilizer you have to put on the soil because the cells are more efficient in taking it up. And they're using editing to try to restore the American chestnut by editing in resistant to the chestnut blight. And then, Kangshita is looking at editing in biograsses to try to increase biomass yields. Alex Harkis, one of our newest faculty members, is trying to engineer artificial sex chromosomes. And you'd be like, why are we trying to do that? Some plants, one gender is the, is the gender that produces the more advantageous crops. I think it's males that produce better asparagus, females produce better barley. But if you can think about ways that you can separate out easily, these are males, these are females, because a lot of plants have male and female in the same plant. If you can separate that out, you can drive your breeding process more efficiently and you can produce better yields. And then Transomic produces custom gene editing tools on, on campus for customers. All right, we got two more, two more to go. Biomarkers, this is probably something that everybody has at least some familiarity with. So a biomarker, is some measurement, some characteristic of the body that you can measure. Not a symptom that you're telling a doctor about, but something you can actually measure, like blood pressure or your glucose level in your blood. And it gives you some sort of information about your health. It signifies uh, maybe a normal process or an abnormal process or a disease or if you've been exposed to a certain toxin. Biological markers include DNA and RNA and proteins and tiny metabolites, tiny breakdown pieces. It's estimated that there are at least 28,000 biomarkers currently in existence. So you may think, like, why do we need another biomarker if we've got 28,000 biomarkers? Well, a lot of the biomarkers, we have no good idea of what they really correlate with. And the goal is to be able to identify a specific biomarker that clearly tells you something about your health, your wellness, the presence of a disease, your response to a medication. Again, Google is my friend. These are the stories about new biomarkers over a six-day window last week. New biomarkers. Biomarkers are popular. Lots of biomarkers are coming out. But the trick is right now, we have a potential biomarker but we don't know if it really truly is going to be able to fully be causative. If I can say, yep, I got this, I see this change, but is it truly going to be indicative of the thing that I am looking for? Because you could imagine a time in the not-too-distant future when you wake up in the morning and on your usual trip to the restroom, or maybe if you're a guy of a certain age like me, it's in the middle of the night, your usual trip to the restroom, but you are providing a saliva sample or a urine sample or maybe you're breathing out into a machine and it is looking for biomarkers and telling you something about your health. That whole concept that your commode could become an indicator of your health and actually be giving you feedback, on the one hand, that's a little freaky for me. <laughs> but it's an interesting concept. The biomarker you've probably heard the most about in the last several months is the biomarker associated with Parkinson's, so alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a typical protein found in neurons that in Parkinson's patients misfolds. Again, back to why that folding piece is so important. And when it misfolds, it causes the other proteins around it to misfold and they clump together. And those clumps are potentially one of the things that causes damage to the neurons and causes the neurons to die. The challenge is that up until this point, we have not been able to clearly biologically say, yes, you have Parkinson's or no, you don't. It's been based on symptoms, based on a doctor doing a physical exam. The Michael J. Fox Foundation has poured millions of dollars into the search for a biomarker. And they announced it earlier this year. Now it's with a spinal tap, not a small thing, but it is a test that actually is 
93% accurate at identifying individuals with Parkinson's or in the early preclinical stage of Parkinson's and does a really good job of not falsely telling people who don't have Parkinson's that they have a positive test. So this is important because now you can really begin to think about clinical trials and to think about how you clearly say, this person has Parkinson's even if they don't have symptoms, this person doesn't. How do we begin to think about looking at treatment and treatment options? That's a biomarker that has huge impact. Now again, it requires a spinal tap, but doctors hope that they may be able to identify this maybe in saliva or in urine so they can make that much more accessible. But huge celebration in the Parkinson community recently because of this biomarker. There are a number of our folks that are looking at biomarkers. I'll start with Rick. Dr. Myers actually identified biomarkers several years ago for amyotropic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. And they're applying this same approach looking for biomarkers for Alzheimer's and for Parkinson's. Sarah Cooper, you've heard me mention her name several times, working in cancer, looking for biomarkers that help us understand how patients are going to respond and when patients become chemo-resistant and the chemotherapy stops working. Kingshita Swaminathan and Alex Harkas are both working on finding biomarkers in plants. Kingshita looking at specific grasses in the stems to tell us something about how the stems are growing and about the strength of the stems. Alex is working with uh, apple and pear growers looking for a biomarker that says this is the best time to pick the ripest fruit. Wait too long and the fruit's too ripe. Wait too early and the fruit's not ripe enough. So can you use biomarkers to give you that kind of indication? All right, home stretch, guys. Home stretch. Last big piece. And it's a doozy, synthetic biology. This is the concept of redesigning organisms by adding in genetic information to produce some new product or some new trait. For example, a new substance like a new medicine or a new fuel produced by a plant or produced by a bacteria. Or to gain a new ability like to sense when something changes in the environment. Like a, a bacteria that can travel through your body and detect when you have inflammation and where that inflammation is and be able to record that and, get, and share that information back. Now on the one hand, this sounds incredibly science fiction-y, but if you think about it, for decades, we've been growing human insulin in bacterial cells. And bacterial cells don't normally produce human insulin. We added in, we engineered in the gene for human insulin. Lots of medicines are grown in bacterial cells nowadays or in plant cells. This is like gene editing, except that typically in gene editing, I'm making small changes. In synthetic biology, I am engineering in or out large swaths of DNA, big pieces, lots of genes in them. I'm gonna give you two stories. When we talk about the microbiome in Biotech 101, near the end, we talk about the fact that the largest population of bacteria that lives in and on your body is in your gut, in your digestive system. And we talk about how that changes with your diet. We also talk about how that changes when you take antibiotics because antibiotics are designed to do what? kill bacteria. And so what does that do to your gut? If you've known someone who's had to have a heavy dose of, of strong antibiotics and then they developed C. difficile afterwards, it's because the antibiotic wiped out much of the normal good gut bacteria and the C. difficile is able to take over. It's a, it is it nothing that you want. So if you can come up with ways to protect the health of your gut microbiome when you have to take an antibiotic, because sometimes you do, what an incredible thing that would be. Well, that's what this set of researchers has worked on. They've taken a, a bacteria called Lactococcus lactis. It grows on cheese, so it's safe for human consumption. If you, if you like um, aged cheeses, you are getting a nice healthy dose of Lactococcus lactis. But they added in a gene that produces an enzyme that breaks down certain types of antibiotics like ampicillin. Now, this bacteria has been also modified so it can't reproduce. So you take a dose of it, it's a live dose, it hangs out in your gut for about a week, and then it dies and it passes on its way. It doesn't take up residence in your gut. But for the week that it's in your gut, it's producing this enzyme that any 
ampicillin that's making its way through your digestive system, it breaks it down. The ampicillin in your bloodstream stays high as it moves to the body looking for the infection, but it protects the bacteria in your gut. It's like a shield, a force field around the bacteria in your gut. It's a pretty cool concept. It's in early stage, early stage trials. They gave it to mice in combination with um, these antibiotics and the gut microbiome were protected, but the levels remained high in the bloodstream. Here's a project, a product that's actually in clinical trials that affects human health. So there are a small number of individuals in the world that have a genetic disorder called PKU, phenylketonuria. They are unable to break down an amino acid called phenylalanine. And phenylalanine is present in a lot of foods. You know, you'll see on the label this contains PHE, phenylalanine. If you have fetal ketonuria and you can't break down phenylalanine, that amino acid builds up in your body to toxic levels and causes brain damage. And infants who have PKU that is undiagnosed and start on normal formula or breast milk have toxic brain damage because the phenylalanine levels just rise to a level that kills cells. That's part of the thing when you do the, it used to be called the heel stick, and now it's called newborn screening. That's one of the things they test for in newborns. Because if you find a baby, a newborn that has PKU, you immediately change their diet. And for the rest of their life, they're on a low phenylalanine diet. And that completely prevents the onset of the, the, um, the brain injury. But a group of researchers looked at a bacteria that lives naturally in our gut and thought, well, what if we added in a gene that breaks down phenylalanine so that we could give it to people with their meal, you know, people sprinkle probiotics on their food. What if they sprinkled this on their food and they took it at the same time and it helped their body break down phenylalanine so you never had toxic levels. So they did a trial, an early stage trial with people that didn't have PKU but had relatively high levels of phenylalanine. And so these individuals, uh, the company's called Synlogic. They drank a powdered version of the bacteria mixed with water before every meal, and it brought their phenylalanine levels down. So now they're getting ready to do a clinical trial with a small number of patients with PKU. This is what's called a live therapeutic. So it's been genetically engineered to produce this new protein that fixes this issue for individuals with this disease. Not a whole lot of synthetic biology going on at Hudson Alpha, but Kangshita Swaminathan is actually working to try to engineer in lipids into plant stems. You might imagine if you can get certain kinds of oils, if you can get plants that produce large amounts of oil and you can easily get those oils out, you now are talking about potentially a natural way to think about fuels, gasolines, jet fuel, because you've engineered those oils to be produced in the plants themselves. One of the companies on campus, Immunon, actually delivers um, uh, immunotherapies for cancer, and they're working on cancer vaccines, and they use a synthetic biology approach to build the envelope that carries those immunotherapies and vaccines. So, we've covered seven things. We've covered a lot of ground. What comes next? Where does the field go? How do we continue to push back the boundaries of seeing what happens inside cells? How do we get a better way to record and gather that information? And once we know that functional information, how can we then design better things that are therapeutic or that are um, preventatives? How do we understand the impact of the environment on our cells? We haven't talked a whole lot about the environment. That's a whole huge component. So scientists around the world are continuing to move that forward. That's what happens at Hudson Alpha as well. Our scientists are continually looking at what is coming down the pike and how can I apply that? Or what's a problem that I have and how can I actually move that forward? One of my goals as president is to double the size of the faculty, the scientific faculty at the Institute to grow that research base. And so for me, what comes next is looking for the people that are asking those questions and recruiting them to Hudson Alpha. You'll hear Elizabeth talk in just a second about a fund that we have called the Innovation Fund that allows us 
to develop new technologies, to seed ideas, and to recruit new faculty. And I'll let you in on a secret. I have a young scientist that I am actively trying to bring to Hudson Alpha. This young scientist actually is using four or five of those emerging trends right now, peering under the hood of cells that have been undergone gene editing, using induced pluripotent stem cells and machine learning to then identify this is what happens in these cells and here are the kinds of therapies that currently exist that we might be able to match to that. It's incredibly exciting. And I'm on the search now for dollars to be able to recruit that scientist to the institute. My goal and I actually will commit to Elizabeth now. She asked me this question yesterday and I wouldn't answer it. I'd love to do an annual seminar about new things that are happening in the field and give you updates. And my, my hope is that next year I'll be able to introduce you to this young scientist and let you hear what he is doing in his own words. I mean, it's incredibly exciting to be in this field at this point in time. It does feel like futurism, that sense of what is possible, but also with a pretty significant touch of reality because we've been burned a few times. And how do we ensure that everybody is at the table having those conversations and we don't just jump blindly into things without thinking about the impact? But it's an incredible time to be looking at the field of genetics and biotech. And with that, you have been an unbelievably fantastic and patient audience. And I will thank you and I will turn it back over to Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody. Okay, well, you just answered my question, which was, did you enjoy tonight? And I would say that means yes. So um, I, I did ask Neil yesterday, is this something you'd be willing to do again next year? And he said, I don't know. I'll let you know. So thanks for letting me know that. Now we all know. We can look forward to it. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to wrap up quickly because I know um, we may have dinner waiting for us. Um, you all received a little flyer like this in your packet, and on one side of the flyer, it talks about the anniversary series, and we have three events remaining in the anniversary series, September 12th, October 12th, and November 30th. We would love to see you there. We hope that you will um, register for those and consider joining us again. On the other side of the um, flyer you have, it talks about the Innovation Fund. There's a website at the top of the page and a little QR code down here on the lock. The Innovation Fund, as Neil said, was developed at his request to identify funding that could be used for strategic growth at Hudson Alpha under his leadership as our president. It funds things like attracting the very best scientific talent, which we're pursuing right now. It includes um, acquiring equipment that our scientists can have in their labs that do a lot of the things that you heard about tonight. It includes pursuing um, new research ideas that can turn into major discoveries that have to have seed funding so that they can be eligible for larger NIH grants. Those are strategic um, things that all need funding at Hudson Alpha so that we can continue to do the things that um, have been set out in our mission to improve human health and well-being. So the Innovation Fund does that. And for this summer, we have been really focused on bringing this new scientist to Hudson Alpha. If you have donated to the Innovation Fund this year, because we've been asking a lot this year, I want to tell you thank you that uh, we look forward to giving you an update about um, this individual that we're pursuing and we hope we have some good news to share soon. If you have not yet donated to the Innovation Fund and you enjoyed what you heard tonight, you, you are proud to have Hudson Alpha in our community, please consider making a donation. We would be so grateful. As a nonprofit, we really do rely on your support and your philanthropy, and we are extremely grateful, and we promise to be good stewards of all you give us. So this flyer has information on how to do that. 
Um, with that, I'm just simply going to say it's great to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, members of the advancement team or I will be around and be glad to talk with you. Have a safe drive home. We hope we see you on September 12th. Good night.